Okay, we're going to get started uh, again. Um, and the first, uh, uh, or the second proposition, rather, is um, NPEs create <laughs> patent markets and add liquidity and efficiency to the IP marketplace. I'll repeat, NPEs create patent markets and add liquidity and efficiency to the IP marketplace. And we're going to start uh, with Professor Duffy. Thank you. Um, one of the basic principles of the law and economics of all property rights is that property should be alienable. In other words, it should be something that you, sh you should be able to sell. If you look at any economic analysis of property, it, it, it almost, you know, that's one of the two or three biggest themes in the law and economics of property. Uh, and, and really, there are very few exceptions to that. If we call something property, um, you can sell it. So if you want my watch, uh, which I own, it's my property, I get to sell it to you. And the reason for that is that if you don't allow it to be sold, you get all kinds of economic inefficiencies associated with um, the uh, uh, about with the market. You actually get a lot of uh, uh, effort being put into trying to find uh, methods to get around a prohibition of selling. In the corporate world, those things could include, you know, a takeover or some other kind of corporate deal that makes something uh, stay literally in the one corporation but allows another corporation to buy the, corp the entire corporation and then get the value out of that. In general, the sort of overarching theme is that prohibiting alienability is a bad, is a bad thing. Um, and uh, in the market for patents, too, I think this very basic proposition uh, continues, uh, and we shouldn't deviate from that. We have no really good theoretical reason to deviate from that. And there's two sub points I want to make on that. First is a, a very homey example about when you go out to buy something in your own personal life that's kind of expensive, uh, like a car. And you say, well, what do I think about when I, when I buy a car? One thing people traditionally think about is resale value. Um, so you might think, oh, used car salespeople, they, 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 you know, sometimes they get a bad reputation, right? In our society, people say, oh, used car salespeople, you know, maybe they're shifty and maybe they engage in fraud sometimes. And, you know, maybe that's true. But a remedy that would say, you know what we should do? We should abolish the market in resold cars would be absolute economic lunacy. Um, we should, if there's fraud, whether it be used car salespeople or some other uh, a business enterprise, we should come down hard on that. Or if there's sharp litigation practices on the part of uh, uh, manufacturers and, and practicing entities versus non-practicing entities, we should come down uh, uh, quite hard on that and, and make reforms across the board. But, we, but prohibiting uh, the sale in the aftermarket in any form of property is just a, a, a true sort of disaster in terms of any rational uh, uh, policy. Um, the, um, uh, the other point about this is the effect of making something inalienable so that you say, well, if you're not a practicing entity, you can't enforce your patent. Um, what would that mean? Well, it would mean that a large corporation that is, that is accused of infringing, if they could just bankrupt their small upstart competitor, they would win the patent infringement. I mean, talk about, I mean, I think that there's some incentives for bad litigation practices now of, of various things. But once again, I think you have to consider the alternative. And the alternative that says you can't sell your patent in bankruptcy which is what a lot of times we're talking about, or you can't sell off your patent when you think, well, I just want to retire, I'm sick of this, I want to monetize my invention, and I'm going to sell it off to somebody who's good at, at enforcing, these, uh, enforcing these rights. If you don't allow that, then you uh, create this absolutely tremendous incentive for sharp litigation practices on the other side. Um, so I think it would be, a, 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 again, a, a sort of disaster to try to say if the, if, the, if the manufacturing corporation can just bankrupt the other entity and put it into bankruptcy, then the patents will be useless because they, we will in some way prohibit them from being sold to a non-practicing entity. Uh, that, I think, would uh, be quite catastrophic. So those are, uh, those are the points 
that I was going to make, at least the, the major points. Um, and I think I'll rest with that because we get the rebuttal this time. Eric Spangberg, John Wood. I want to let our closer finish it again. Um, Mariano. I, I want to uh, put my corporate hat on for, for a minute and uh, uh, give an analogy or, or tell a little story. Is, first, let me tell you how I know the guy to the left of me is that uh, I was actually sued by him about seven years ago in, the, in, the, in, a, in a function, in a job that I, I have. And, uh, and, and, and I still sit here next to him on this side, so that should be enough to vote for us anyway. But I'm going to quit drumming up votes. <laughs> It's, uh, you know, I will say is that I, when I'm in a company, and I think this is a fundamental problem that people distinguish from uh, in patent trolls a lot of times in the industries that I have been in, is that they are a lot of times viewed as nuisance suits in manufacturing industries like the ones that I've been in because they don't go to our core products. Okay, so they are something on a website. They're something on a way we sell things. They're not on the product that we know, we use, we make. Okay, so being in a corporate atmosphere, I look at things and say, okay, here's what, as a company, how we make money. Okay, in an R&D function, we go out there and our R&D is not drawn exactly to that end product. Okay, it's not going to be. This R&D net is thrown wide and then the product is a narrow product down the road. Okay, our R&D person could have come up with a great idea that doesn't go through our machine and get produced in the marketplace. But we filed a patent application as we should as the system in sense and we get that property right someone else goes and makes per, commercializes that property right when ours is on full view we put them on notice we do all sorts of everything that's required okay but it's not one of our products should that other person be able to infringe my property right just because I don't produce that product. Now, go into a boardroom and sit with your executives and say, hey, listen, these other guys are infringing our product. And they'll say, oh, we should go after them. We should, this is not right. And they'll say, okay. The next question, everyone will say, what's this gonna cost us, John? And they'll say, you know, patent litigation the other guy that says you have, have so nicely used that there's this big gap that's being used by the MPEs, patent litigation is going to cost uh, at least average $3 million. You hire the fancy New York law firms, it's going to cost you more. You're looking at $15 million for through appeal, okay? And then all of a sudden they look around the table and they say, who's going to pay for this? Okay, what's the risk involved? Okay, how can you Okay, if you get past summary judgment, judge, what's the percentage of, of that I can tell my client that we're going to, to win this case? So you're telling me that I'm going to spend, okay, $7 million we'll put on there for a 50% chance of winning on a product that makes us zero money today. And they look at me like I'm crazy, okay? You can't get someone in a corporation, well, the corporations that I've been in and the people that I've, I've counseled are not willing to take that risk. So what happens is, is that you have an expertise that, have grown, that has grown up in the division of labor. You have lawyers that are good at litigation. You have companies that are good at making products. <clears throat> Who's good at evaluating whether a, a patent is a good risk to take? I can assure you Eric gets pitched with a hundred patents for every one that he takes. Okay, so he's good at that. If I can go to my boss and say, look, six years of litigation, a tremendous amount of resources, and 
$7 million, I'm going to give you a 50% chance of getting $50 million, or I can get you $5 million today with no risk. What do you think they would take at that point? Okay, with that, I'll turn it over to my friend here, who's, <laughs> who, who owes me from the check that my company wrote him a few years ago. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I don't think that there's a doubt that NPAs <clears throat> create a patent market. Um, if you look at sort of recent developments, um, IV launched about the same time we did in 2003, and they've acquired 35,000 patents from, you know, all, every university, all major companies. Um, you look at what uh, Micron did uh, uh, about a year ago when they spun off to Round Rock. I think that they sold off 2,000. It was about a sixth of their portfolio. Um, you just had Matt Powers leave Will Gottschall, who was making you know a really good living there, um, and he's now out sort of you know up, up, he's been funded and he's now out buying in the market. So I don't think there's any question that that NPEs create help create a patent market. Add liquidity to me, same thing. If there's a, if there's if there's a market, then by definition there's probably some liquidity. These are nowhere near as liquid as they should be, and the reason for that is is because lawyers are evaluating them and they're really bad at evaluating stuff. So the the asset class is so misunderstood that there's this huge arbitrage opportunity, which is all we're benefiting from now. But that will slowly diminish. There's a bunch of computerized tools coming out that are going to help, uh, help help with valuation. And you know, people say, well, they're all different. Well, I got news for you. So are options. People told me those would never price out. And you know, in 1985, Black and Scholes came up with a little bit of option pricing model that was kind of obvious when you think about it in, in hindsight. But at the time, it was great. Same thing will happen in the patent space. Um, efficiency. If we mean by that, um, it, it gives John an opportunity to make the business decision to sell versus assert, yeah, that's, I guess that that's efficiency, at least the way he'd probably define it. Um, I, I'm not sure what the net efficiency is. In other words, by let, turning these things loose, is it doing some overall efficiency in the economy? It's a macro argument that I, I don't know the answer to. So, but fundamentally, I think that what you're seeing in the market is, is the, as a result of the Nortel sale, as a result of the Motorola sale, C-level executives are saying, I'm done entrusting this to the lawyers. We're going to get this um, and make a business out of this. And they either do it directly or indirectly. They assert themselves. That's Apple's model or semantics models to sell off to me or to IV or to whoever and then take a percentage interest in the back end. For them, that's much more efficient. It's an outsourced licensing model for them. Um, and that's simply how they see it. So I think that the, absolutely in the patent market, liquidity for sure, efficiency, it depends on which efficiency you mean. Okay, we're going to go <coughs> go to the other side. Professor Merges. Okay, so I, I want to to take aim at that at that last point, the efficiency point, um, and uh, that's where I'm going to ultimately end up here. Uh, let me start out with a couple things that I don't think we are going to say over here, even though um, you might hear our side characterized this way. So I don't think anybody on this panel uh, is against property rights. Better not be. Uh, <clears throat> we're certainly not against the principle of, of alienability. And I don't think any of us here are what I would describe as anti-market um, to the extent that uh, these are kind of basic building blocks. Um, you know, we all start from the proposition that that's probably the right set of building blocks uh, to start with. Um, however, having said that, um, not all voluntary transactions where one person pays and one person sells are a good thing. Not all transactions that uh, are voluntary under the rules as people find them lead to efficiency. Um, you can take lots of examples. There's, a, there's an active market in some places for uh, what's called, you know, euphemistically protection. If, uh, if the police department is weak, and organized crime is strong, people will make a rational decision to pay for protection. That is a voluntary transaction, and it makes perfect sense given their situation. That doesn't mean it's efficient. That doesn't mean it's a good thing. Likewise, there are places uh, where uh, enforcement is weak or uh, uh, where sort of the political will is weak, and people can sell themselves into slavery, people can sell their children, people can sell illicit drugs, people can sell their own bodily organs. Those are voluntary transactions, and given the rules as they find them, they make sense. That doesn't mean that they're good. That doesn't mean that we should not aspire to do something about those markets, right? So my point is, sometimes, if a market has bad effects, we think leaving it in an unsupervised state is not a good thing. 
Now, you've already voted and said, the majority of you have said, <laughs> that this market can have some bad effects. So it seems to follow to me logically that it doesn't make sense to leave this market unsupervised. In other words, there may be some, in fact, I believe there are many patent-related transactions that do increase efficiency. When an employee assigns his rights to his employer, um, makes perfect sense in most cases. When somebody who's come up with an innovative idea licenses it to licensees, you know, the Dolby Labs or Dean Kamen example, of course, to facilitate vision of labor and to, to lead to efficiency, that makes perfect sense. However, sometimes it would make sense to look a little bit behind the transactions and to say, do we really want to encourage this particular transaction? Do we want to encourage this kind of aggregation? Do we want to encourage this sort of litigation mill? Do we want to encourage this litigation-oriented model? In other words, we can be a little bit fine-grained and try to sort the good from the bad, just as we sort other transactions, the good from the bad. Protection rackets, no. Legitimate insurance, yes. Normal labor, yes. Slavery, no. Pharmaceuticals approved and regulated by the FDA, yes. Illicit drugs, no. All we're saying on this side is that not all patent-related transactions are efficient, and I think you've already said you agree with that, and that's pretty much our case. Mike Lynch? Actually, John. Okay. John Paul. So why are we really here today? Are we here to say that someone who has a patent can't hire someone to help them enforce the patent or license the patent? That certainly isn't the position that any of us are taking. That is acceptable behavior. So why is this such a cause celeb? Why are we spending lots of time thinking and talking and making laws around this? Well, it's not the isolated and occasional assertion of a patent that is creating the buzz, is creating the problem. The problem is that there's a creation of a secondary market where the market makers are agglomerating risk and they're agglomerating it in at least three different ways and the agglomeration of that risk changes the world as we know it. So what are we talking about? If there's someone who is a professional and whose job it is to collect patents from people who are willing to sell them or provide the rights in some fashion and put those patents into a basket, they are agglomerating a certain amount of risk that the individual patent holders have been unwilling to take on themselves because lots of things could go wrong with each of those patents if they were to assert them and it costs a lot of money to assert them. But if you accumulate a large enough number of patents, the sheer number of patents changes the nature of the transaction. We all know that patents are expensive to analyze, they're expensive to enforce, and there's a lot of risk associated with asserting a patent, uh, both in terms of liability and in terms of the amount of damages that you could get. So by agglomerating lots of patents and having that business, that reduces the risk of the agglomerator, of the NPE, of the person who is in this business, of the patent assertion entity. And it causes patents that would otherwise not be in the marketplace and which have very speculative value to get into the marketplace and create <coughs> transactions that really don't have a tremendous amount of value except for the agglomerator. The second level of agglomeration is that these businesses, the patent assertion entities, are not only doing it one time. They're not only putting one basket together. It's their job to put these baskets together. And so it's basket after basket after basket. And so when you're talking about mitigating risk or spreading risk, as an insurance company would, these companies are able to spread the risk even broader in that fashion. And they are like the, the uh, personal injury lawyer who takes on lots of cases, most of which settle very quickly. And they live by the hope and the dream and the eventuality that one of those cases is going to pay off big because the probability 
eventually is going to come in their favor. The difference, as we said before, is that the personal injury lawyer is dealing with a much simpler kind of factual analysis. Patents are very complex, and so the transaction cost pushes up the, the, the situation. And the third level that probably is the one that caused everybody to really start to stand up and, uh, and scream was that it's not just one of these companies. There are more than one company, and the number of companies are growing, and the ability of these companies to do what it is that they do well has improved tremendously. And so if you're in a company that makes products and possibly innovates those products, and you are used to and are willing to take the under-the-radar occasional meritorious lawsuit, the occasional uh, frivolous lawsuit, this is a very different situation where there is a substantial number of claims being made on a regular basis that costs a lot of money to pay them off, it costs a lot of money for the lawyers, it costs a lot of time, and it costs a lot of corporate attention being directed to things other than the corporate business. So that, I think, is really the issue here. It's not an issue of being able to sell your patent rights. It's not an issue of being able to have somebody help you sell your patent rights. It's a question of agglomeration, spreading risks that would otherwise not be taken and that shouldn't be taken, and most of that money ending up in the pocket of the market maker rather than the buyer or the seller. Mike Lynch. <clears throat> and I'm going to build on just a couple of John's thoughts there. With respect to the example of patents that should not be asserted, if I'm patent counsel for a large company, uh, I have some patents that some of my management wants to assert, but I think that they are relatively weak. Uh, I think they may have some issues. There's a natural check on what I'm going to do with that before I go against one of my competitors and start some sort of war based upon weapons that I don't think are really all that effective and aren't going to advance the business perspective. Uh, however, if those patents are then sold off to a non-practicing entity that has no straightforward risk, now those patents may be asserted as part of an agglomeration, you know, as you know, cog number 27 in the uh, wheel of the uh, assembled patents that they're going to assert in litigation. So they're, uh, once again, the, the just probability odds of uh, being able to defeat every single patent that's thrown at you are highly problematic. Um, and I think the aspect of seeing companies that are selling off patents so that they can be monetized uh, reflects that there are probably patents that are being asserted now, typically by MPEs, that would not otherwise be asserted in the marketplace. Can that really be promoting efficiency? It's certainly promoting some monetization, but is that really efficient for the overall marketplace? Uh, I also would raise a question about uh, certainly a number of, of NPE business models. I can think of one. Uh, firm that I've had uh, the privilege of representing several <coughs> clients against. Uh, and their business model is really to take uh, a patent, no matter how really irrelevant it might be, no matter how manifestly invalid it might be as asserted, assert it against a number of companies and just try and get out for $50,000, $100,000, whatever they can get out of it figuring that, well, that's money that wasn't coming in otherwise, and it's cheaper than trying to fight me on it, so just go ahead and pay me that. And, you know, a number of companies will do that. That does not seem to be bringing uh, efficiencies to the marketplace. Uh, one thing to sort of keep in mind, uh, I think, is that it, at least in electronic device, semiconductor companies, probably very few weeks go by for any sizable company uh, that there is not a new offer of a license on a patent, a new invitation to open discussions. Uh, the, the number of these 
threats that come in is really amazing. Sometimes they want 1% of your revenues, sometimes 2%, sometimes it's 5% of your profits. But by the time you've got a lot of companies wanting just 1% or 2% of your revenues or profits, uh, it doesn't take too long before there isn't anything left to, uh, to really deal with. So I think there's uh, definitely efficiencies in that it's easier for some people to sell patents. Prices seem to be going up from what I'm saying, uh, but I don't think that's the overall question of efficiencies in the overall IP marketplace. Okay, panel two, any rebuttal or do you concede? <laughs> <laughs> Well, no, I'd like to agree with certain things and, and, and make sure we understand what we're debating here. First of all, uh, I do agree with Rob Murgis that alienability uh, is a basic feature of property rights and that we want to encourage that. And then he gave several examples of things where we do intervene in the market. One, he talked about protection rackets, and he said, well, that's a voluntary transaction. Well, of course, it's not voluntary if you say, pay me money or I'll burn down your house. That's not usually what we consider to be voluntary. And if we're talking about private markets for protection, well, we do allow that. You see these little security symbols. As long as they come and say, we'll give you security services to sort of protect your house, and they don't say, and if you don't buy it, I'll burn down your house. <laughs> we say that's legal, and we, we allow that. Now, selling people. Um, I think involves civil liberties, and I'm actually kind of surprised. I mean, I think you should vote it, not just on, you know, the, you should vote on the arguments that have been put forward here. And I think that if you think that, you know, selling a piece of paper, a patent right, is something like selling a person uh, of the kind of history that we've had with that, then vote against me. But if not, at least consider... <laughs> That, that invention was my baby. Just, consider, <laughs> consider that this is, you know, we're trying to evaluate this on the merits. But, um, and then he said, you know, you already agree with me, so go ahead and vote my way. So, you know, uh, that's sort of a cheap trick. Okay, I lost the last vote, but only by 4%, and there's a recount going on. So <laughs> I'm not sure of that. Um, the, the, the second point, which uh, 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 John Paul made, which was about consolidating risk, uh, generally, we think creating, you know, eliminating risk in society is a good thing. But if we want to have a debate about whether patents should be consolidated into portfolios, I, I think that's an interesting debate. But but that's not anything about uh, about patent uh, about non-practicing entities. The biggest consolidator of a patent portfolio is IBM, without doubt. They gain a billion dollars a year. This was facts from years ago, a billion a year in licensing their patent portfolio, and everybody knows how they do it. They come and say, you know, we'll, we will come and we'll light, you can get our whole patent portfolio, or we'll litigate against you with a thousand patents. John, and a thousand lawyers. The and a thousand lawyers. Of rights there, in addition to their licensing revenue, from the products that they're making from that agglomeration of, of, of rights is also Well, well, the, uh, in the sense that they are, they are consolidating. They are consolidating a huge amount of of, of patent uh, uh, patent rights, and that's the way that they and that's the way that they uh, uh, get money. And I don't think there's necessarily anything wrong with that, but I don't think it really has anything to do with our debate here about whether it's a good thing to consolidate. Uh, 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 patents into large portfolios. I will say that if you allow alienability, that gives the right to the small person as well as to the large person. I think the proposition on the other side is there's something really bad when non-practicing entities say, well, I've only got one or two patents. Um, I'll sell it to this person who's an aggregator, and then they will have the same strength that IBM does in trying to license their patent portfolio. Um, and I, I don't see why that's necessarily bad, but if it, it, it seems quite discriminatory towards the small individual and the small inventor if you say IBM gets to keep its consolidated patent portfolio, but the small invention um, should not. Um, now, the final uh, point was that patents are sort of, there's a natural check on, on asserting uh, uh, bad patents. Um, again, I'm not so sure about that in the sense that uh, if, you, if you believe in the, the, the sort of patent thicket story is that large corporations do consolidate their patents um, and they threaten their patents and you don't see a lot of litigation because 
uh, it's, it's, it's big corporation against small corporation or small entry level corporation or small individuals. And therefore, you know, we don't see that as a problem, but I think we do, uh, that problem is certainly out there. Um, and, uh, and it's just as much a problem. But I think that's a, that's a different problem. It's a problem of bad patents, which of course that we've already stipulated we're all against bad patents. And it's a problem of consolidating things into a portfolio. I will say one other thing, which and is and that- Only one other thing. Yeah, just one other thing. <laughs> which is that, that the alienability market does give us a tremendous amount of information about the health of our patent system. If you see a, a, a system where patents sell for trivial amounts of money and then they have to be sort of asserted in mass, that does tell us something. Uh, but it's a, but and it may not be something that's complementary to our patent systems. Uh, something very happy about our patent system, but it provides us that information. We may not like that message, but if we just cover that up and say, oh, we'll forbid alienability or we'll forbid these these types of patent transactions. We'll be covering up the problem, but it's just a symptom of the large number of patents that are being issued with conflicting and vague claims. It's not really getting at the problem, and that can also be a problem for true inventors. If I, I have a true invention, I'm worried that patents aren't, aren't, aren't really solid anymore. You have to <coughs> aggregate them with the large group because nobody knows whether a patent's valid or, or what it really means. I would be concerned about that. I think we need to look at the patent market, the patent aftermarket it gives us a lot of information about the health of our patent doctrines and about the health of our patent system. And we may not like that message right now because it may not be such a great message, but it's extremely valuable that we keep that market open and keep patents fully alienable without restriction. Okay, <clears throat> um, we're, we'll take some questions. I'm gonna start off with a question because uh, this is, uh, there are a lot of lawyers in the room. Uh, Mr. Spangenberg, himself a lawyer uh, by, uh, yeah. by background, many years practicing law, he said, words to the effect are lawyers are not good at, at valuing patents. And uh, uh, the question is, why do you think that's the case and what can we do as lawyers to, to be better in that department? So the, um, this asset class should go transactional. Um, the analogy I use is, is that 20 years ago, when you bought a house, a lawyer came into the room with you in the closing. I'm still not sure why. Um, and you can go buy a really expensive house today, and you'll never see a lawyer. So it's just it's just gotten productized. There's standard forms for the mortgage. You don't negotiate your mortgage other than the rate. Um, and that's what needs to happen here. So what, what lawyers, and I'm painting too broad a brush, and I am one, um, tend to do is they tend to look at damage models. And they're like, that's the value. Well, no, it's not the value. That's if you go drag somebody through the keyhole, and you yourself go through the pain of litigation, which and, and I, I know very few NPEs who would not love a system where there was no litigation. Now they want some way to trigger some way to trigger the negotiation. Unfortunately, you know sometimes that's what you have to do in order to trigger the negotiation. But every one of them would prefer a market. Every one of the big companies I work with, I work with everybody from you know Delphi, General Motors, on down the line. What they want is they just want a more efficient way to monetize this asset. They want to outsource it. You know they don't want to talk to somebody who's going to charge and say I'll solve all your problems for a thousand dollars an hour. That's not what they want. What they want is efficient solution. They don't want somebody to come in and analyze it for six months and say, well, maybe this, maybe that. Then another six months, maybe this, maybe that. They need decisions. So they need like a franchise. If I was in your position, I was going into business, what I'd do is, is I'd come up with a high value solution for them and just let them plug into you. That's what they want. They're just looking for a way for these to trade. Okay, Tr uh, Tree San, we're gonna, we change the rules a little bit. You have to walk down the stairs and speak <coughs> with the microphone. Yeah. We especially want to hear from those on the fact, on the fence voters. We really <laughs> want to go after them. I have a question for Eric. I was following your argument all the way through on how you said NPEs create markets and they add liquidity. My problem comes, or my question comes, is when you said and and how you dealt with how they create efficiency in the IP marketplace. Because the way I look at it is the way um, John framed the argument. <laughs> And from a corporate standpoint, you know, all of a sudden we get the lawsuit from the NPE, and now our resources are removed. We have to take people from research, we have to take lawyers, we have to take, you know, people in the software department, we have to take people from risk, and we all have to move those resources, and we have to pay attention to the lawsuit. And that patent may be valid or invalid, we don't even have the time. So how do you create efficiency? when instead of our resources have now been removed towards litigation, 
versus creating um, new products, you know, affecting our business, or we pay you know your money so that you go away and we don't care whether you have a valid or invalid patent. So I'd like to understand the efficiencies that the MPE creates. Yeah. So so you've picked out one segment of yeah. the sort of value chain. And what I'd say is that if you really wanted to measure this, you'd have to sort of start a little further back in time. So look back at the, at the R&D lab when they, were cre when, they, when they created the patent um, and start measuring efficiency from that point forward. I think you've identified by far the most inefficient piece. Um, and at least personally, I'm a strong advocate of that going away. Um, just personally, about uh, in 2005, 0% of our revenue came outside of litigation. Last year, it was about 30% outside of litigation. And I hope to get that up to like 80%. It, it's just horribly inefficient. So wh why do they do it? Well, because people like you, when I send you a letter, you actually pay attention because you know that I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid to file a lawsuit. It's, and I think that it's sort of like uh, somebody analogized it to a SWAT team the other day, right? The SWAT team shows up. They don't shoot you. They don't have to. They got scary uniforms on. They got scary masks on a big scary truck and scary weapons. You know that they're willing to fight. That's not the question. So I don't, I think that ultimately by virtue of being a really bad, horrible litigation machine, what happens is over time you actually drive that to a transactional model. That's the hope. But I don't think there's anything efficient. Are you efficient the threat of litigation, so now you're paying them? I think it's relevant. I think it's relevant, but the other piece that we layer in on top of that is intelligent pricing. Right, so the reason, look, Apple, Apple's, not, Apple's not scared of me. They've got $30 billion on their balance sheet. They could crush me if they wanted to. But if you go in with an intelligent, proposal and say, hey, look, this is why this is relevant to what you do. And no, we're not asking you for a billion dollars. We're asking you for whatever it is. That's, that, that's the beginning of how an efficient market should start to work in this space. I, I want to I add one thing is that I think one thing that's been missed in this whole discussion today is that uh, these patents are published after 18 months from filing, and then they're public once they're issued. I know what my products are in the company where I work, and we spend a tremendous amount of money trying to uh, make sure those products don't infringe. So my, my, my belief is that you should understand what you're, where you make your money and you should make sure that you're not infringing. Now, you say, well, this is something that's not core to our business. Maybe it's something that's on your website. Maybe it's something that's, I'm, I'm not sure what your experience with trolls are, but my, you at that point are making a decision, once you've been sued once, as to, okay, what's patentable, what am I doing, and what am I clearing? Because this information is public out there, and you have, the, you have notice long before you get that letter. So the resources can either be spent once you're sued or up front. But there is a financial analysis that's going on for that. But John, I, I agree with you, but you're, you're going to know the patents out there for what is your core business. You're not, and you're going to make sure you're not infringing those core business patents. And we spend a lot of time doing that, but you're not going to know the patents out there that are Direct, you're not looking at the patents that are directed towards your yeah. website or to yeah. some software that's but running your manufacturing. <coughs> if, if it made good financial sense, you would. For purposes of this conversation, can we send this patent counsel for those Should I mention John's affiliation again, no, just no, for no, the record? No, no. Okay. I mean, this is this is something that's gone through my, my head when I've paid out sums for patents that I believe are valid and I believe in a pop property right. So I, if someone has a valid and enforceable patent, then I don't mind paying a royalty, even if it's not my core product. But I've gone through the analysis and I've gone through the resources of trying to figure out, okay, on the website, okay, then you go back to the division of labor argument that I had earlier. If I'm not an expert in that area, which I am an expert in my product area, if I'm not an expert in the website area, I am utilizing the property rights that are on that website. I am benefiting from those. Otherwise, I wouldn't be using them. You can always choose as a company not to use the website. Okay? 
but I could hire someone to clear everything we put, or I could get the expert who sells me that website, outsource that, and get them to indemnify. There's many, many ways to handle that risk. It all goes back to risk. And so to say that these are coming out of left field, I think is, is a complete, is a complete. Uh, these things are published. So John, <laughs> I, I don't, first of all, I don't know you anymore. And second, um, <laughs> second, uh, we should, in fairness, I think, I think these guys are trying to control the debate now. I think, I think yeah, we've we got to give the other side an opportunity to, do you have a response? You must have a Thanks response. Thanks for revealing your troll-like tendencies <laughs> once again. I, 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 want, I want John to be able to answer the question on the, on the difference between plaintiff's lawyers and, and products liability lawyers. Sure. The plaintiff's, uh, pro, the, 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 the tort injury, tort. the tort law, and the, uh, and the property rights that we're talking about. Here. Right. Well, I think one of the things that's being talked about here is what does a sensible company do when they're trying to clear a product? And what they don't do is look at every patent that could possibly be asserted against them and, t and go and seek licenses or set cash aside to pay for those eventualities in areas that are a little vague. And I think that that's part of the point that's being made here, that you have to make judgments. That's what a company and their lawyers do when they're analyzing whether they can get a product on the market. And there's a lot of patents out there that may possibly sometime be asserted by somebody, but you're not, you're not going to stop the product before, because of that. If somebody gathers all of those marginal patents together and asserts them against you, it's a very different equation because the probability that one of those is eventually going to hit increases dramatically. And so I think that there is a difference between individual action and collective action, and I think the law recognizes that in a lot of places, certainly in antitrust involving patents. There are things that you could do independently, but if you collude with somebody, there are certain things that you can't do. So I think there, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a much more complex situation than saying, well, we can go and check to see which patents are infringed and which patents aren't infringed. There's a lot of stuff that's the gray stuff in the middle that makes very good fodder for people who are trying to make a market of it. And I think that that's what practicing entities and people who are trying to go about their business of, of developing and selling products are very concerned about. And I'd just like to make another comment, and that is that I think that a lot of the larger corporations who haven't been in the monetization area are starting to look in that area, and we get inquiries from companies that we do other work for. And what, at least what one of my perceptions is that these larger companies are very reluctant ultimately to pull the trigger and get patents on the market because they're afraid whose hands they're going to fall into, how they're going to be used, and how it could possibly affect their customer base. I mean, this is, this is anecdotal, but the liquidity of the market for their patents has been chilled by the NPE activity. And you can see that from companies like HP who insist on having clauses in their patent transfer agreements that restrict the use of those patents to defensive purposes and will not allow those patents to be asserted without having something coming at you for a period of years. So in effect, these are, these are real, real world effects that have resulted from the NPE and the secondary market. Okay, um, we're actually out of time um, and it's now time to vote. Uh, so if we get ready, uh, again, the uh, proposition NPEs create patent markets and add liquidity and efficiency to the IP marketplace. <laughs> We're not too far from Chicago here, so you could vote early and often. Uh, 
you have to be careful about John when he talks about uh, a recount because, you know, he clerked for Justice Scalia, so you want to be thinking Bush v. Gore. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not turn this into a political fight. <laughs> Wait, so agree is this, one is this panel. Right, one is this panel. We're still one. Panel two is one. It's so <laughs> Yeah, this is, it's a, it's a little Sorry. confusing. I don't know why I didn't read it. Maybe clicked. 100% yeah. the wrong way. <laughs> no, 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 we're resetting. Sorry. It was resetting. All right. Disregard that. <laughs> Maybe One for us, up. just so there's no confusion or, or, or butterfly ballad or chaz. It's as clear as mud. <laughs> it takes a little one minute here. It's still tabulating just a little so important to tie things together. Did everyone vote who wanted to vote? All voting in? I should have brought my kids with me, you know, I, know, I could have really. stacked the voting a little bit more. <laughs> it's so close. It's just a couple votes shy. <laughs> Okay, thanks. All right. We'd like to thank okay, the well, audience. Okay, well, I think uh, to the victors go the spoils, right? Is that how it goes? Um, a round of applause for, uh, for the, the panelists. Great job.